Good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third installment of the Visiting Artist Lecture Series for Spring 2021. The next lecture in the series will take place on March 9th with artist Sana Musasama. I want to encourage you to visit the Art and Art History website for more information about this historic program and all upcoming presentations. This presentation will include the artist talk followed by a short Q&A moderated by me. Please type your question in the chat box at any time to the right of the video on YouTube. My name is Laura Vinson and I'm a first year MFA student in the painting and drawing department. And today I am introducing Mark Sabatis, an intermedia artist who is currently based in Manila, Philippines. Mark earned his BFA in advertising arts from the University of Santo Tomas. Under the title Salvage Projects, Mark's practice deals with the debris of everyday politics in the city remnants of the blurred history of the nation and its complicated narratives and the fragments of the constant movements that he's confronting and experiencing. His practice is influenced by the internet, advertising, and pop culture. Through his use of photography, videos, installations, and participatory projects, Mark explores urbanization, familiar objects, and chance encounters. Mark has exhibited his work in international solo and group exhibitions, including the Sharga Art Foundation, Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul, Asia Society and Museum in New York, and Mori Art Museum in Tokyo. He's been featured in articles for the Art Forum and the Ocula, and his current exhibitions include Notes for Tomorrow at Cantor Fitzgerald Gallery at Haverford College in Pennsylvania, which is up until April 11th, and we are going to have to live outside at Vargas Museum in Manila, Philippines, and that's up until April 9th. Please join me and give a warm welcome to Mark Sabatis. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, I would just like to thank Kirsten and Megan and Thomas for coordinating and organizing this, this talk. So I will share my slide. So uh, this is a photograph I took years ago from a view from our house window in my hometown in Lokban, Quezon, four hours away from the capital, Manila. It's called Mount Banahaw, known for its mystical and enigmatic energies. I will do my presentation as a journey, and this is the place where I started. My hometown, Lokban, is a small town, and most common source of income is farming, cooking, or anything related to food. Growing up, I'm exposed to the harvest tradition of payas. Literally called decor, to decorate, a thanksgiving of bountiful harvest every summer. From vegetables, fruits, local foods, and crops, houses are adorned with colorful and locally sourced materials to celebrate for one day. Originally a pagan tradition of offering, good, of offering to gods and goddesses and to nature, it was converted into Christian celebration by the Spanish colonizers by offering the harvest to a saint called San Isidro Labrador, the patron saint of farmers. The festival was a big influence for me as a young child, participating in this yearly festivity that the whole community is involved. Since my hometown don't have any museums or galleries when I was growing up, this was my first exposure to art, I should say. Objects put together, installed temporarily, lived experience, local materials and context, participatory, and so on. My practice developed along the way when I went to Manila to study advertising. I call my overall artistic practice a salvage projects, basing the word salvage or save, or made safe, exploring the complexities of the word to connect in relation to movement whether it's physical movement or movement of ideas, rural to urban to elsewhere, survival, threat, debris, whether it's trash or fragments of history, humor and play, and I try to build layers of visual languages and different tendencies, and by making a work, I strive to understand and misunderstand the world where I am situated. This particular image suggests of what I call salvage, jeepney, 
the most common form of transportation in the Philippines, a debris from World War II from destroyed U.S. Army jeeps. Filipinos then began recycling them to be a utilitarian icon. As rehabilitation of the country due to war slowly builds, an identity of the streets also created its way for the masses. Drivers, artisans, and craftsmen were motivated to put colorful decors, upholstered benches, installed lights and sounds. As each jeepney is owned by a driver or an operator and not by a corporation. It carries individuality rather than uniformity, decor of the urban folklore. But the symbol of the street is facing the challenges of the neoliberal world through modernization and regularization. The word salvage is also the meaning of my surname, Salvatus. Salvation, Salvacion, Salvador, or Savior. But in Philippine vernacular context, salvage is a wicked word. It is the exact opposite meaning of to save. It is the summary, it's, it is summary execution or extrajudicial killings, which is contag contagious in this current regime. To salvage is to kill, to save from what? It is also coming from salvaje, as wild, untamed, savage, uncivilized. Complicating the context, complex and unstable signals, signals were formed, deformed, and reformed. Moving away from the mountain to the rural, I desired for the future. I started as a street artist in Manila, one of the most densely populated cities in the world. As a vast and immense city, almost everyone is finding and trying to make their own space to mark their own territory. The city is the future for me as a young artist, coming from the countryside with curiosity in hand and mind. But what is really the future? I call myself Boy Agimat, a triangular eye that sees the city in many different ways, trying to be visible and vis invisible at the same time. Receiving the inspiration and frustration of the capital in my own eyes. In Philippine folklore, Agimat or amulets are used as personal protection from bad spirits, a charm for good luck, and was used in several local rebellion against the coloni colonizers and other armed struggles in the 60s and 70s. A medallion or a piece of cloth, an object of belief, belief as an act of survival. Void sky, lost war. Booze, steel, fine man. Ask mom, no porn. The divide is obvious with destruction and construction of what is a better the city originally came about as projects of the future, according to Boris Groys. People moved from the countryside into the city to escape and look for a better future, marking as a form of existence individually and collectively, even if it's anonymous. Collecting poetry of unknown tags in the streets that wants to be seen or heard. Talking walls, echoing surface, a collective haiku. Building an idea of play, that everyone is part of the game, understanding a sense of I am here, or we are here, that is always misunderstood a ghost writer. I found myself working in communities, neighborhoods, and cities. Traces were collected from random passersby. Objects that are attached on their bodies, inside their pockets, inside their bags, on that particular moment, and wrapping it on the wall as a collective imprint, on a communal wall, as cavemen told their stories thousands of years ago. Rap is about revealing our contemporary way of life through traces of objects, wrapping as a marker, wrapping as preserving, but at the same time, temporary as pencil drawings on the wall. Tracing and wrapping went to different places as a migrant, a transient, temporary but leaving an imprint that will also be gone, a human act of existence, belongings as traces, belongings of where to belong, 
where do we belong? Manila is about survival. It's built layers upon layers of contrast and continuity. It's a city of unwritten rules. People has its own rules, you do or die. In 2009, I chanced upon a news report about a secret garden in the city jail, where jail guards and wardens found a garden growing vegetables in one of the cells. The inmates grew vegetables from leftover foods, from seeds, peas, and other root crops, building and creating another world, world in a captive environment. A garden we all need to breed in order to live, we have to find it, seek it, or build it, even if it's a prison called life. A garden no more than two inches high. Welcome to the Gates of Hell, a short description of Dan Brown, a famous American author which he described Manila in his book Inferno, a never-ending loop of opening and closing of gates that talks about layers of issues concerning about security, public-private relationship, urbanism, architecture, and design, as well as the sense of threat, power, divisions, and boundaries. Gates are about welcoming, at the same time, unwelcome, a paradox we always experience and create. We build walls, we protect ourselves, it's security and insecurity at the same time. What's behind the gates? The walls, we create divide. It's also decoration that dominance is present. Live the life you love a vision of greater things. Life's simple joys are always within reach. Indulge yourself and live the high life. Home is where the advantage is. The city, our gallery. Brochures from Manila property developers cutting out the images of the artist renditions of the proposed cond condominium buildings and creating a small model city in a utopian state. From the base, a CCTV camera was installed and broadcasted a live projection on another room, creating an illusion of mega city. Camera is, is, it, camera is controlled. It is secured. Buildings are controlled. It is secured. But what is the meaning of to be secured? A constructed reality. To float is to adapt, it's a way of life. The Philippines is fragmented as an archipelago of more than 7,000 islands. It takes different currents to adapt to be able to survive. Manila was hit by a super tropical storm in 2009 and I experienced floating in my old neighborhood in Manila. What is the complex relationship between the public and the private, survival and threat, game and play, nature and our surroundings. Wraps made out of everyday objects make us rethink perceptions on fear and doubt in relation to the instinct of surviving a disaster. Through these objects, multiple layers of relations and functions are crafted and constructed, further exploring the idea of consumerism, urbanism, everyday politics, and climate change. It's the cycle of calamity and to overcome. Will it float or it will sink? Erasing as a form of revealing, marking as a form of deletion, collecting, as a re collecting and repeating as a negotiation. Maps are the geographical representation of the land, a tool to navigate directions and also to mark borders and lines. We can hold the landscape in our hands, folding, Marking, markings as drawings, codes are made, an imprint by man on the land. It looks like being erased, wiped out, blackened out, camouflaged. But it also reveals something, many things. Man's desire to exploit the land. Landscapes are flat, viewing patterns of everyday navigation, 
a repetitive gesture. Key chains link together, forming what appears to be a map on the floor, which borderlines kept changing as people would accidentally walk over it. Lines as drawings to build a connection, but it is also to divide security checks, border patrol, immigration police to make a boundary, a game we always play. We can also cross, change, alter these borders. What I'm interested in is the organic notion of borders. It is when the borders are constantly deterritorialized de by peripheral communities and negotiations, evoking the ingenuity and spontaneity of residents through various forms of human relations and community building. An accessory of power, dominance, and survival. Used army uniforms and clothes with camouflage patterns were collected from different thrift shops and secondhand shops in Manila, called ukay ukay. When translated into English, it's dig dig. Repeating the word dig or to excavate, the act of digging is synonymous to land, extraction. Most of the clothes from ukay ukay come from countries like Canada, US, Korea, or Hong Kong as donations or an excess to be exported to developing countries like Philippines. The distribution of these excess clothes can become very common in almost every cities and towns. The camouflage pattern hides the threat from beneath the surface by using its dazzle to compound the viewer into submission as a decoy to rethink something else, likened to animals to survive and to attack in an arena game of life. It is contesting for ownership of space, for a piece of property, or to monopolize resources. The camouflage pattern is to blend to the surroundings, to disguise the agenda of the land, from jungle, desert, snow, and urban combat. The pattern is an evolving pattern, depending on the environment, the nation, and its uses. The materiality of clothes and uniforms also talks about the body and its connection to the land, the socio-political situation, economy, and fashion altering its uses that the military is concerned about. Making a mark or territory is not any more physical, but also virtual and digital. It is about landscape, digital technology, and body. Human condition was inspired by René Magritte's La Condition Humaine, and local revolt against the Spanish colonizers led by Hermano Pulet in my hometown in Lucban. He was a Filipino religious leader who founded and led the Cofradia de San Jose, Cofraternity of St. Joseph. The Cofradia was established in 1832 in response to the racially discriminatory practices of the Catholic Church in the Philippines. During the Spanish colonial period, Catholic religious orders refused to admit native Filipinos as members. In retaliation, Pule established his own religious order, which was exclusive for native Filipinos. They also incorporated elements of pre-colonial pagan beliefs, such as use of agimat, or anting-anting, or the amulet. Hermano Pule was captured and executed by firing squad at age 27 by the Spaniards. The authorities had his body quartered. His dismembered head, hands, and feet were exhibited throughout our hometown and nearby towns. Inspired by this local revolution, I look into the uprisings, revolt since 1980, from the, my birth year up to now. I'm studying the connection of the body to the land through revolutions using Wikipedia and Google Maps to navigate the history and the different locations. I collected traces of bodies present on Google Maps, partially blending the body to the surface of the land. The ghostly appearance or the ghostly presence of the bodies on digital maps marks an intricate relationship between the physical body, the landscape intertwined with the digital landscape and the supposed spirit of revolutions. 
These found images on Google Maps is also a way of tagging, tagging us to graffiti artists, and now we tag ourselves in digital maps. An instant location and photograph tagging as a base for making territories and imagine las landscapes. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Cyberspace thus becomes a retroactive speculative sphere. The ghostly presence of bodies on digital maps marks an intricate relationship between the physical body, the landscape intertwined with the digital landscape, and the supposed spirit of revolutions. The trace, however, is ultimately evidence or witness or witnesses. What's left behind are the land, the streets, the plazas, the parks, and other open and public spaces a solid witness to the events and spirits that may still be walking around. But these new imagined images on another space can blend the relationship of the body to the ground, growing and also dying. Traveling is not only the physical movement, but also time. Time traveling makes us imagine or reimagine the world, past and the future, connecting it to now, debris of history, fabricating story based on a, an illustration that is part of Boxer Codex, a manuscript written in circa 1950, which contains illustration of ethnic groups in the Philippines at the time of their initial contact with the Spaniards. Naturales, which means local, is about a journey or passage of a man and a woman, maybe lovers, husband and wife, king and queen, who happen to meet in different time zones through reincarnation. The setting was shot in Tondo, a district of Manila located near Manila Bay and Pasig River, and now considered as the most densely populated district in the city. The illustration is being re-illustrated imagined and reconstructed not as a narrative but a fictive moving composition fiction as a way to reimagine a local fiction to repossess a history that is always western as top to bottom portrayal these portraits become up the portal multiple in context portal to different imagination of the nation and its connection to the contemporary society Part of moving is migration, and moving is also about coming back or revisit. Being a still is not an option. I bought my uncle's laptop as secondhand, not knowing that there were several photographs and video clips saved in his files. He worked as a seaman for almost 25 years, and his last voyage was in 2012, returning home in the Philippines to retire. I asked my uncle if I can have it, and he said yes. I selected some of the photos and blurring his personal details. Still and static, the photos are somewhat an abstract narrative of his voyage from the Philippines and beyond. Not only about his personal voyage or travel, but different layers were revealed through these photographs. Labor, migration, economy, capital, family, the sea, the land, distribution, and circulation. An estimated 460,000 Filipino seafarers are employed worldwide, more than any other nationality. One out of every five seafarer in the world is Filipino. Archives, as we accumulate experiences, objects that has altered meanings or a long span of echo that still linger us, an open inquiry to what, is, to what it will bring us, like poetry, giving us energies like spirits, movements and traveling is a major component of my practice, but I found something back in my house which my father had collected. Images also migrate, how we view, how it is presented, photographs as a record, imprint of time. It can be fact or fiction. What do you want to see, to frame and to reframe? In 1975, Italian Hollywood super actress and starting to be a professional photographer, 
Gina Lollobrigida, was commissioned by the First Lady Imelda Marcos to do coffee table books, The Philippines and Manila, both published in 1976. A copy of those two books were found in my father's collection, dusting in our home library. The books were published when the country was under martial law, which was declared in 1972 by the dictator Ferdinand Marcos, financed by the Philippine National Bank. Gina Lollobrigida's trip and book project was a propaganda book on promoting tourism and obscuring what was really happening in the country under the new society period, a fantasy and nightmare at the same time. Published in Liechtenstein, the book was limited in copies with cliche touristy scripted subjects like beaches, farms, smiling people, naked children, and ethnic groups, especially the Tasadais. It presented stereotype images for a foreign eye to visualize the country amidst the reality of martial law. The book was intended for European market. Presenting collages of the original pages of the book side by side by found clippings of Gina Lollobrigida's film stills, also from my father's collection. The collages tries to complicate the idea of fiction and storytelling, image making and fantasies. One can make his or her own interpretation of the past through complicated narratives. Another project from an object of the past, rereading to be present, and to this case, to re-listen, to re-imagine. I found a vinyl record, another, uh, I found a vinyl record from my father's collection, a copy of the Philippine Constabulary Band pressed in 1970s. A marching band formed in 1901 during the American colonization, founded and headed by African-American Lieutenant Walter Loving of the U.S. Army's 48th Volunteer Infantry. At the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, the United States fe featured a human zoo of people from their newly acquired territories, the Philippines, including Cuba and Puerto Rico. The Philippine exhibition involved over 1,000 Filipinos from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, who were instructed to dance, sing, and perform rituals, a place that they have no connection at all, a forced migration for the purpose of exhibition. The Philippine Constabulary Band participated in this live exhibition, where its performance of Rossini's William Tell Overture caught the attention of composer John Philip Sosa. The band would go on to perform at US President William Howard Taft's inauguration and for the Japanese Emperor Meiji and Hawaiian Queen Liliwa Kan Kalani. More than 100 years after their performance in St. Louis, the music still lingers. I asked the current military band to play the overture, this time complicating the tune of the contemporary empire, side by side with the vinyl collection of my father. What does this past have to do with the here and now? the later and elsewhere. The music is the migrant, and the migrant is the music. The Philippine Army Band who performed in 1904 in the US is I consider the first musicians or entertainers who was sent abroad to entertain, to play cover songs, Western music and popular songs. And today in every hotels, bars, from Seoul to Dubai and in cruise ships, you can see Filipino bands or singers covering popular songs for the glo global demand to entertain. Music, political interest, and the migratory workforce converge to sketch a complex history of labor and influence. The territory is in the music, as the music is the self. The same as whistling, whistling marks an imaginary mark that I'm here. Making marks and leaving traces, physically, materially, virtually. One might question the land and its purpose, like our ancestors looking towards the future. It's the only thing that they can maybe have and share. 
the wisdom of the land. I thought the future is in the city as it is made really for developments and advancement of man. But I look back to my window looking at the mountain. Museo ng Banahaw is an ongoing and growing collection of anything related to Mount Banahaw, the mountain you saw in the first slide. It started in 2010 as a series of snapshots of the mountain I took every time I go back home. It's not to romanticize the mountain, but learn from it, receive knowledge and its energies. Archiving texts, photographs, lyrics, and other stories that has always something to do with the mountain. In 2018, I extended the project by asking friends and relatives to share their photographs of the mountain. The mountain become the collective spirit. The Mount Banahaw acts as a magnet, a ref refuge to various communities, as, as a safe ground for religious and spiritual sects. The New People's Army, the arm wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines, and a supposed site for UFOs to refuel, creating new worlds and prodigies. With rich biodiversity, the mountain conceived as a place for people who don't want to be governed, different from those who live in the cities and plains. These communities are longing for the second coming of Christ or a revolution waiting to happen, as likened to the mountain as paradise. How the future is imagined by our ancestors before the colonizers came. How the mountain can be more advanced in building any other form of community. It is true imagination of how can we make new possible world that builds energies rather than meanings. Because of revisiting, the unexpected encounters become a continual surprise. A photograph from a newspaper was found while doing another research. A carnival for a simple celebration, an event not religious or political, paying a tribute to the year that was. A news clipping about a masquerade happened in 1910 of unknown people in a town I was born. It only happened once and it happened again in 2019. An or, or a continuation. I made an announcement to be done only once in a blue moon, a masquerade and a parade in our town. People gathered to celebrate that was cel celebrated 109 years ago in the same town, in the same street. A tribute or an act of acting or role playing, a transition between two colonizers in the early 1900s, masking with faces you cannot explain or don't want to show their emotion. Positioning the emotions and entertainment or state of ambiguity. The masquerade and parade will happen again in the year 2119. Two years ago, we were dancing. Two months before the pandemic, the world slowly shifted to a slower phase. My practice revolves around the action of movements and travel. Everyone has to stop. Traveling and tourism is a major player for global capitalist demand, leisurely and economically. But to travel is also about forced movement, migration to work elsewhere, human trafficking, exodus due to conflict and war. The ob and objects also travel. Objects travel more now than human because of restriction due to the virus. Shirts become debris of the global movement of people, tourists, business, migrant workers. It's the closest to our own bodies. It is a cycle of movement. The excess of travel, work, and leisure are made into flags. A representation and also misrepresentation. An embodied territory. I will end my presentation with home exhibition for Yoji, a project that emerged from the pandemic. It's an exercise for me and our son Yoji. His classes were suspended towards the end of their school year last year in March, almost a year ago now. 
and summer schooling was transferred online. Yoji cannot go outside under the quarantine law in the Philippines. So he was confined to the house, interacting with us, his toys, his phone, playing games. It was in May I started to present everyday objects to him when summer school ended. I presented temporary constructed objects as sculptures and installations in different parts of the house. And he decides if it's good or not by posing a thumbs up or thumbs down. A quick decision if it's good or bad. It's an act of play. An offline and online project that arises during the crisis, not directly responding but reflecting, intimate but urgent, as we were restricted of our movements and forced lockdowns, the home become the microecology. It's the psychological, spatial, and the material we share. The home is also the site of care as well as violence, a setting to be settled, but it's also unsettling. The objects were made only for a day by attaching and installing temporarily, unsecure and precarious are in state. It is unstable a life that we continuously, continuously fix and shape to be able to survive. Thank you very much. That was awesome, Mark. What a beautiful oh, presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat now. But um, I have so many questions, but I'll start with my own. Um, so throughout your presentation, you know, like you shared um, some works that included haikus, um, as well as like mm -hmm. just the work that you chose and, and the phrases that are, you know, throughout your, your work. Um, and, and, you know, some people even quoted a few things like organic notions of borders um, and belief as an act of survival. And so I'm, I'm curious about how important writing is to you, um, like in your artistic practice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think writing is very important. And also it's how you kind of articulate your work in a longer term, because I think uh, when I make work, I have some some uh, pre-set my, my concept already, but throughout while working, and also even though it's already finished the work, it changed a lot. And uh, every time the work kind of writes on its own. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it's constructing itself. So I'm, uh, because I think also as an artist, I want to be like not the idea of dominating the material or the subject. It's, uh, I think the material's dominating me in a way. So it's kind of, I want to create this kind of setup because the, the materials or the subject or medium that I'm working with are the one who gives me this kind of maybe energy to do. And writing is important because it helps me to re-articulate it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, when I was growing up, I'm not really, I don't really read that much and write, but along the way, I become more into readings when I went to Manila because there's, there's always like a contrast when you read, it's not about understanding, but also about misunderstanding. It's about communication. And writing is about that too. It's about understanding. But at the same time, you need to misunderstand. So I think that's, I don't know if you answered the question. Yeah, yeah. I, I also noticed that because you just said like understanding and misunderstanding. And um, there were a couple of other times where you mentioned these sort of like contradicting things and, and mm -hmm. um, I personally love contradictions and I think that that a lot of people can relate to that feeling of like being visible or um, as well as invisible or, or security and insecurity. So what do you think draws you to those contradictions? I think 
the immediate environment, I think, shaped this kind of consciousness about this contradiction because I lived in Manila or maybe coming from the provinces or the rural and then to the urban. So you are not only living in one place, but your body may be still attached or mind in uh, your where you came from. So this kind of two always shifted in one way or another. So I'm, and I think it's important to have these shifts. We always shift because uh, shifting is also the idea of you know, adapting and surviving. And I, I, I guess all of us needs that shift at one point. That's why I think this contrast is important on how we perceive the world. So I think by making artwork with this idea of uh, frustration and inspiration is, I don't know, it's really good to question ourselves, not only as an artist, but also maybe as a person. Because mm -hmm. I think that's why we, I make artwork, is to question, really. I want to, to know more because, uh, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> so I think compli to be complicated is uh, I don't know, interesting for me. <laughs> It's complicated. That's a good. That's a good answer. I think <laughs> um, that's all very true. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Um, I think Yumi asks, "Can you talk about oh. some of your curatorial projects, um, like uh, Lode Nadito, and how those overlap with things you discussed this evening?" Mm. Thank you, Yumi. And. Uh... So aside from my own practice, I also work as an uh, initiator, or I, we initiate projects. And uh, currently, it's Lo Nadito with my wife, Mayumi. And we're also questioning the idea of how to present art in different contexts and, and, and forms. Uh, because also, as an artist making uh, an artwork, there's another aspect of that. It's the exhibition. So art production and then exhibition making. And I think exhibition making is how you present it to the larger context or bigger audiences. So Load Nadito is a, is a platform or initia initiative that we developed in 2016 without the concept of a space, a physical space. And when we do projects like the idea of parasiting or the idea of uh, not permanent. So I think it also resonates with my practice as an artist that maybe art is the idea also to be not secured or not fixed. For example, in the exhibition or museum, the works are fixed, no? It's installed mm -hmm. in the walls or no. But maybe we can create something that is not fixed. It's uh, changing on its own. Or maybe, yeah, the idea of organic. So Load Nadito is something like that we try to, to develop. I mean, we still don't know what direction it will go to, but we're always uh, interested with uh, working with other people, with other disciplines because this kind of adaptation is also important in, yeah, in maybe exhibition making. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something that you're kind of currently working on continuously or? Yeah, so side by side. So it's par parallel with uh, my own individual practice. And then uh, the Lona Dito is, I'm working with my wife, Mayumi. And we call it's not a collective, but it's more on to the more on initiative. And then we develop projects that we consider important to to develop or to show, like workshops or even exhibition, one day exhibition that's based from the idea of the festival, the Pahias Festival. 
So it's a one day exhibition in your in the front of your house. But the idea is for artists to, to do it on their own houses. And then there's a digital component of it, like a virtual. So we are playing also with this idea of non-center. So there's no center of where to go to for an exhibition or project or artwork, but decentering it or spreading out, spread it. So to create some kind of like, I know, uh, an open uh, or imagine that, imagine, imagine space, even though you're mm -hmm. in different places. Mm -hmm. I feel like that really um, resonates with right now and and quarantine and just this past mm -hmm. year and um, your work. It's so interactive in a lot of ways. Like um, I feel like it it involves people in a way that it's tricky now. And so I think that's a really cool way to evolve your, your practice. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. So I've got a question here. How does your focus on historical and contemporary colonialism engage with a global conception of indigenous art and indigeneity? <laughs> that's from, uh, <laughs> Yes, Plato. <laughs> oh, okay. that's Richard. Hello. Okay. <laughs> mm. uh, I think um, I don't speak uh, as, as an artist, maybe personally for me, I cannot speak in behalf of the, uh, like, uh, the indigenous or other people because I myself is, I know, not. I mean, um, we have different, totally different background. So my my tendency is to work with objects, and these uh, objects, especially from the past, like for example, the book that I found or the vinyl records, it's a simple object, but it, but through developing projects with this object you kind of connect it to very different layers of maybe history of that object and it connected to a bigger, larger narrative of the history. So it's the idea of maybe articulating or expanding or complicating, as I said again, is to complicate this you know, uh, tendency. Like for example, uh, the the vinyl record or the photographs of my uncle is just a photograph. It's n I'm not representing maybe him as a, a like a Filipino worker, but you can see as the photograph as already a, a one tool to start for because we work in, in visual and uh, this visual languages is how you perceive the work. So as maybe shown of this, how to connect it to, you know, to, the, to the bigger context of, uh, of indigen indigenous you know, material. So I think it's the, you know, the material itself is strong enough to to resonate with the how you connect it to the bigger picture and in a context of uh, being uh, personal people really connect or experience through objects it's really through objects we are connected firstly in my own opinion because it's really attached to our own bodies and these uh, objects is sometimes we just think it's it's just a banal, banal uh, entity, but looking through this materiality, where it came from, who used this, and I because I always I like secondhand stuff, so <laughs> this kind of like creates me something of, to think of. Uh, this uh, object becomes political because it came from this place, 
the army uniform is uh, the pattern is very you know, connected to the landscape. So this kind of things I always look differently and uh, intimately maybe and yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. All right, I, I completely agree with that. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, I really could see that the objects that you, you chose and used um, were used before. And I think um, that's really powerful. It, it, objects are, are, they say so much about the individual and, and um, yeah, it's super powerful. Um, let's see, Bailey Not Diamond okay. has a question about, um, I would just say like, thinking back about, you know, how you got to where you are and, um, you know, um, do you have any advice for people that are like aspiring artists or, or anything that you kind of wish you could have been told when you were an aspiring artist or a young artist? Mm -hmm. hmm. It's, uh, I think uh, the environment shapes the artist or maybe the, the, as a person and uh it's a uh, it's a crucial for the artist to be aware of where she or he is now standing or connected and because there's the notion of artist is uh i mean in the western context of artist in art history is like it's to be genius or in the secluded uh, studio, right? That's what uh, we are taught about, like the masters and everything. But in the context, maybe in my own immediate environment, the art is is not really taught in a local sense. But as you see, maybe we've been doing it for a long time. Like as maybe uh, the, I'm going back to the festival that I grew up with, the Pius Festival, it's in a way an installation or an installation art, like putting things together, but it's not recognized as contemporary art or art. But I see it differently. I see it more how put things together, how it's installed. So going back to local, maybe it's uh, interesting to look up, especially if you're an artist making work in a place that maybe uh, you want something truthful to where you are living now. So going local maybe, and maybe also reading and writing locally, that helps because the language also uh, develop and uh, Going back to local also, it's not about going back again, but it's like something that is like maybe hidden before or being erased out before. So I think uh, maybe my advice is to be, just look in the immediate environment and maybe immediate materials will come, immediate concepts or ideas will come like, when I went back to my home or house, I found materials already available. So I think, go, and also this time of pandemic, everyone becomes intimate in their own houses. It's not mm -hmm. going out because before we are uh, just, uh, uh, we just follow the demand of the contemporary lifestyle or society. But now, I think the idea of reflecting or slowing down, just uh, uh, being aware in your uh, aware of the environment you are living with. So I think that's one uh, way to see the world. It's not the big world, but small small world. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great. I, I love that. Um, I have a, a little bit of okay. a. A lighter question from Alvin. He's he just is curious about what is behind you. <laughs> what is the ah. shape? Hi, Alvin. I know Alvin also. So this is um, 
actually the mountain also. And I, I haven't uh, showed it. I didn't show it in the slides because I don't have that much time uh, preparation uh, documentation of this. But this was part of a video that I'm showing in in uh, the show currently in uh, Pennsylvania. And it's about the mountain also. So since uh, we cannot really travel to see the mountain, so I brought the mountain here in the, in the house. <laughs> because I still believe in the, no, the energy of the mountain is real and the spirit of it, it's real. I don't know, because this is very interesting. It's like a, it's a, it's like a entity that, I think everyone shared, like especially if you live in a place where the mountain is very visible and everyone kind of shared that spirit that uh, this is the mountain that I grew up with and I connected with. And I think it's also one way to reveal that we are always connected with land or we are connected with uh, where we are standing. And this is, also, that's why I, throughout my practice, I developed this connectedness with land. But now I'm in Manila, so it's all concrete. So I think that's why also being a street artist connects in a way on how I see different surfaces, different uh, no, structures, man-made or natural. Yeah, so the surface and then, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I was just going to ask, you know, moving forward, is there anything you're working on now or any sort of projects mm -hmm. you can go into a little bit? Yeah, so I'm developing a new work for a group exhibition in October. It, uh, I think my projects is in a way connected to each other. Uh, it's uh, not not like everything is like separate. So that's why I call it salvage projects to create kind of umbrella, not to make a direction of what I'm doing, but to create some kind of like like a, like a energy ball <laughs> to to put everything there, and then I'll just pick something, and then okay, maybe this will be good in my 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 next project. So the next project will talk about the idea of ghost and city. And uh, I think you've seen the, the work about the, the, no, the Google Maps with the erased bodies. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm developing it for a project in Taiwan in October. I'm working with the curator Tessa Guason. And we are the, developing the idea of how the, the, the land is still connected with the spirits, especially the idea of revolution as the idea of spirits, no? If we call mm -hmm. about the uh, spirits of, for example, in the Philippines, we have EDSA revolution and EDSA is a street it's where the revolution happened. And they said the EDSA revolution is dead because it's not anymore in their, uh, they forget about this uh, that happened in 1986. But the only thing left in the space is the streets. And the, uh, the witnesses are the, the pavement. And I'm interested on this, how these plazas or streets or public places become a place of congregation of people to have this collective spirit. But after that, it's totally gone. So we are like hunting the spirits through this kind of like, uh, so we're just complicating again, this, uh, no, this, uh, no, this notion of the space and the body but using digital you know, concept or digital you know, means. So yeah, that's I'm 
currently BC. And aside from Yoji, our son, currently BC. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to, to see it. Um, all right. Well, this has been incredible. Thank you so much again for sharing with us, Mark. Thank you, Laura. Bye-bye. We lost market. <laughs> I think we did this last time too. Um. <laughs>